talk about embedded switches. Embedded switches. Yeah, embedded switches. So I, I hope this is parallel to a lot of stuff we've already been talking about. And um, as a preamble, I guess, a lot of this stuff is, I mean, more sitting current problems I have with some, some things I'm working on. So let's get going. Uh, the first thing that I, I want to mention is, so I recently posted some uh, patches to do what, what I called VSI type. It's another um, link type. And basically what it does is it pushes out another net dev um, that the hardware can direct packets to based on an FTB entry. So it's similar to SRLV in some sense that it's the hardware that's doing the switching, um, but it it's doesn't, isn't backed by a virtual function. So it's basically a set of queues um, that spawn on top of the PF and then has a set of queues that get to be used through net dev. Um, and the way I built this, and I submitted the patches, but the merge window was closed, so I'll have to wait for it to open again, it is basically through IP link, um, and you just add it like you would a, a Mac VLAN. Or, um, and it really looks like a hardware offloaded Mac VLAN, and that's what I was going with for um, from a model point of view, because Mac VLAN is something I think people probably understand, or, or at least people that are using them understand. And this is kind of a hardware offloaded version of that. Um, and this is just kind of how I'm just showing you what the model would like. Like, um, your driver comes up, you have what we call a VSI, which is an IEEE term. It stands for Virtual Station Interface, um, on top of your Mac. So that would be like your ETH0 on your PF. You can do an IP link add in this model to create a new type VSI. Um, and then it creates another VSI, and that corresponds to a net dev. So after you create one, you have two net devs and an edge relay. Um, an edge relay is a switching component in the hardware that does the switching based on a forwarding table. So basically, there's a very simple flow table in the hardware that can uh, send packets to either of these VSIs based on what you have programmed in the flow table. Our existing flow tables are mostly Mac VLAN at this point, but you know that's, uh, that's an existing hardware limitation. Um, they should become more flexible as we get some more of these parts coming out um, to do more layer three, even IP-based or, or something like that forwarding. Um, and then I show here you can do more, uh, have more than one. And yeah, I think the patches I submitted were built on top of IXGBE, and I supported up to 32. Um, maybe that's not enough, but future hardware should have more. And the actual hardware can support up to 64. So the 32 was um, a limit that I, is artificial. I should probably make it up to 64. It just requires some tweaks to the number of queues that you can support per VSI. Um, so that's that basic. Yeah, good. Uh, a VSI, in this case, would be a pool. That, that's the, the mapping. So a pool would be a set of queues. And I just wrap those queues in the net dev as a convenient way for the OS to understand that that's a separate net dev with a separate Mac VLAN pair, possibly its own IP address, um, and so forth. Yeah, Greg. VMDQ or NetQ? What'd you say? It's the same, it's the same hardware mechanism exposed to the OS via net dev, net devices. Well, we don't have a VMDQ implementation in Linux today, right? So there is no VMDQ support, which is, in case you don't know, VMDQ stands for Virtual Machine Device Queues, I believe, and it's uh, supported in the Intel hardware. This is a generic version of that, basically. And we implement it via VMDQ. So uh, I know other hardware supports similar models. They don't call it VMDQ. They call it something else. Um, but basically, a set of queues or a pool of queues um, mapped to and into the OS via net dev is what we're doing here. Um, also with the hardware um, doing the switching. And that's what that hardware flow table's for. Here's just a quick slide. It's the same thing. I'm just showing you that this exists with SROV as well. You could do this with multiple VFs and have multiple VSIs all at the same time on your, um, on your device. Um, for this talk, I don't know how interesting it is. But this is actually the interesting piece that I wanted to get to. Um, so what I'm struggling with right now is, is trying to figure out 
how this is useful for a virtual switch and in this environment. Because um, once you put a V switch, even if it's a Linux bridge, but OVS is more interesting, um, on top of your, one of your VSIs, you effectively have two switches in um, cascaded. So you have a first hardware switch that gets hit by the packet, and the packet's going to get forward to one of the VSIs, and then you have a, a software switch behind it. Um, so a couple problems kind of arise when this happens, and I think I have them here. Oh, the, the first thing on that, sorry, a little out of order, is we, are, we have this FDB interface today, and that's how we program the switch. Um, it's the same FDB interface that's used with the um, uh, standard bridge. So if you're going to use the Linux bridge, that's how you'd program FDB entries. VXLAN uses it to program F, uh, its entries into the tables. So the, the hardware can also be programmed via the FTP. The driver hooks into the has hooks to hook into it. Um, there's a series of you know, classifiers that you can add. This is some I made up, because I'm trying to figure out exactly what classifiers are useful to send to the hardware. Um, this should look close to something the OVS would understand. The ones that we have today are on the top row. So death source, Mac, ether, well, actually, we don't have ether type, but we have VLAN. Um, at least in the Niant or the Intel cards. Um, but presumably, you could eventually have all of these different flow types, and you could send them to specific VSIs. And the idea, idea there, then, is you could have a VSI for a VXLAN tunnel, and it would receive all of the traffic for that VXLAN tunnel ID. Or um, maybe you have certain desk ports that you want, or TCP flags. Uh, TCP flags are interesting for load balancers. If you captured every SIN, FIN, and reset flag, you could presumably build a load balancer on top of a VSI. Um, and then do the forwarding in the actual hardware after you establish the connection. Um, so if, if there's some input and people care, let me know. If you have a specific you know, classifier that you care about, I'd be interested to know about it. Um, the next question is, this was a crazy idea that came up. Um, today we talked through Netlink through this FDB. Um, we actually have um, the ability to, on some of our future products, or um, if there's actually a real switch behind this, to talk through sockets. Um, I don't know if this is going to go anywhere. I'm throwing it out there in case anyone has similar thoughts about this. But basically, you could have a manager in user space talk via socket interface to a firmware agent running on the hardware. Or maybe, um, or if it's a full switch, like some of these things that John Ronchak talked about, the 40 gig, 100 gig stuff, maybe you could do something like this. Um, it's there. If you have any thoughts on this, let me know. I, I don't know where this is going right now. Um, so I have some problems that I'm working through on this. Um, as soon as I have VSIs connected through my hardware switch and not through my software switch, doing what we call east-west traffic, um, from one of my VSIs to one of the other VSIs creates a bunch of problems performance-wise. Um, mostly, the, I consume PCIe bandwidth that I probably don't want to because it's just a software-to-software -software VSI connection. And I get additional interrupts. Um, so I was trying to figure out how to solve some of this. And one quick, maybe naive way to do this is just create another connection um, into the vSwitch. Um, and then you can do, you have two... Uh, VSIs, you have a local and a remote kind of thing. And so all your local traffic would go over this second link, and all your remote traffic would go out the edge relay. Um, I don't know if this is a good idea. Um, the last comment there is I, I thought we were trying to simplify things, and it looks like I'm just making things more and more complicated to get around this. Yeah? So the, the VSI would be um, connected to the VM, most likely through like a Mac VTAP kind of device, like a pass-through Mac VTAP. No. So, so this is, I am not, um, one of those VSIs could be a VF, and you could direct assign it. And I think, actually, that might be my next slide. It says that, you know, you, you can't connect to the vSwitch if you're a VF, because you're direct assigned. Um,
<laughs> you need a, you basically need a switch below there to, to demux those things, right? And then to know if you're local or remote. And then that, that's where the last comment comes in. It, it seems like you're just making things more and more complex. And really, we're trying to simplify things here. Um, but what, at the bottom line, what I'm trying to do is offload part of the vSwitch into hardware um, without uh, making things overly complicated for everything above the VSIs. Kind of OK. Yeah, so, so the big performance comes if, skip through all these really quick, if for something like this. If, if, if the vSwitch, if a packet comes into the vSwitch and the vSwitch was going to turn it around and send it back out a different port, then I got a big win here because now I can do the port forwarding and the actual edge relay on the hardware and never push the packet into software at all. Sorry, what was that? This is, this is looking more like a, a switch. I mean, this is not no longer a, an embedded switch in a hub. This is just a hardware switch on the network. In, in a lot of ways, yes, I, I agree. But the, the point I think here is that sometimes we could, we could have a bunch of VMs on this host that are general VMs. Um, but the switch could also, um, there could be VMs on another host, which is why you do the, do the forwarding. So we may not know if the, when we get to the system, we may not know necessarily that that packet is destined for a local VM or, or something remote. Um, a load balancer would be an example. So we're running a load balancer here on the host, which has a bunch of VMs on that host as well, comes into the system, um, and we may load balance to one of the VMs that are local, or we may need to load balance to a remote VM if we're crossing a certain point. In, Chris is shaking my head. He's going to say no. You make it at a, a tour, kind of. You want to put it at the top of rack switch. So um, in the, I'm trying to see how far John Ronchek went with the talk. Did you talk about the RSA stuff? Okay, come on. The aggregated switch, the RSA? OK. Um, the point might be that you, if you don't have a top of rack switch, there are a highly p a powerful top of rack switch that you can run this on. This is a way to get around that. So if you're going to run your load balancer as a service, basically, if you have a use case for that, then I think you have a use case for this. Yeah, that's another way to do it. Every, you, you, you could also argue that you don't need VSIs to do that, right? Um, you could just extend the FDB of a single VSI, right? The other way to do it is actually create a separate net dev, which is what I would propose here. But if that's not, if all you're trying to do is manage promiscuous mode, you could just program the tables into a single net dev. On transmit? Yeah, on whatever So on receive, it's nice because that's what you do. You effectively bypass the vSwitch if, if everything can be handled in the hardware. Okay, so um, we have two flow tables here. 
one for hardware, one for software. I expect whatever entity is driving the software flow table is also driving the hardware flow table to keep them in sync. Right. right. From here, I, I, when I say vSwitch here, I mean the data plane of the vSwitch. So I would expect the control plane of the vSwitch to be managing both tables. Right, yeah. So what we're saying, what I'm saying here, and maybe that's a key point, is that we push both. You push, you push the hardware model as a, as a singular block, and then the software vSwitch as its own block. And then you let the control plane try to merge the two together if it needs to. And as long as they expose the same model, I'm OK, I think. Yeah, and I think as long as they can, you, the trick there is to get the air paths correct, right? If I try to program a flow into a Broadcom card that's not supported, it needs to somehow feed the air back to the controller, and the controller needs to handle it. it looks, I think it looks a lot like when you try to program a flow into a switch and the, the TCAM tables are full. It's really, I think, can, I think our controllers can probably handle that somehow today. It's all, it's all on the same PCI bus, um, which, is, which is why, if you're just doing VSI to VSI traffic, it might not be as great an idea. <laughs> Go ahead. All right, sure. Yeah, so, right, exactly. Um, so a Mac VLAN is basically a simple switch um, device, right? It, it, you can either run it in VEPA mode or VEB. VEPA mode is going to send everything out into the wire, and VEPA is going to loop back between the VSIs. Um, but the, the switching is actually done in software in that case. So um, packet comes in, goes to, into the Mac VLAN switching code, and then it gets switched. On transmit, you, you do the same thing. Um, in this case, it's all done in hardware. Because we have an edge relay in hardware, we can actually do the switching in hardware. Um, so to avoid doing the switching in software, we just move it into the hardware. Um, I guess you could probably try to make the same device use the hardware, but uh, it seemed easier. Um. Not a bad idea. I'll have to. <laughs> I'll uh, see if it can be done. Um, okay. Or I think it's what, 32,000, Greg? You know? My way of thoughts? I guess it's, no, I got a guy, 512. I, I, it depends on what kind of hardware we're talking about. And then I'm looking at the hardware guys. Yeah. <laughs> depends on the hardware. Um, is it, if it's just Mac pairs, it's. <laughs> it, it depends on what hardware. I think the Niantic is 64 at this point. Mac VLAN pairs is what I'm talking about. Uh, 128. Look at the Red Hat guy. You know. 
<laughs> so I'll, I'll figure it out. It, it, again, it depends on what you're talking. What hardware? The existing hardware is relatively small. So, all right. Thanks. Yep.